Good morning and welcome to today's lecture. We have been discussing the uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis and we learned in the last lecture that Big Bang nucleosynthesis starts at a temperature <coughs> of 10 to the power 9 Kelvin where the uh, for the first time this reaction neutron plus proton they uh, combine to form deuterium <coughs> this uh, reaction uh, starts off uh, in a this reaction is uh, is able to produce significant amounts of deuterium so uh, uh, this is uh, where uh, the uh, Big Bang uh, nucleosynthesis uh, started, and rapidly it uh, the available the neutrons that were available at this temperature they rapidly got bound into helium four. So uh, the end product was helium 4 which is the uh, uh, light element which has the deepest uh, binding energy per uh, nucleon. So, uh, so once the nucleosynthesis starts it uh, proceeds very quickly and all the available neutrons are bound into helium 4 and we saw that the uh, that these uh, detailed calculations which we did not discuss but I told you that detailed calculations and the arguments which I presented in the last lecture all of these they indicate a primordial uh, helium abundance of the order of uh, 0.25 and uh, a more precise number would be 0 0.24. And this is weakly, we also learned that this is only weakly dependent on omega baryon h square but sensitive to expansion rate of the universe. And it is sensitive to the expansion rate during the epochs prior to 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. So, it is sensitive to the expansion rate between 10 to the power 10 and uh, 10 to the power 9. <coughs> In this range, where the neutrons they decay and get converted into protons. Uh, protons. So, this is uh, what we learnt in the last class that. Uh, uh, a brief recap, recap of what we learnt in the last class. Now uh, today we are going to continue the first part of today's uh, lecture we are going to continue our discussion of uh, uh, nucleosynthesis and uh, so uh, let us come back to this. So what I told you is that the neutrons are quickly bound uh, into the uh, helium 4 uh, nuclei into to form helium 4 nuclei. But the point that we shall take up today is that helium 4 is not the only product of this uh, nucleosynthesis and there are other nuclei other light, ele uh, light elements uh, nuclei of other light elements which are also produced in much less quantities. So, one of the first examples that we can talk about is deuterium. So, there will be some deuterium which does not get converted into helium 4 left at the end of the uh, of the nucleosynthesis. Similarly, so let me list all the elements all the nuclei that are left at the end of nucleosynthesis uh, of the big bang nucleosynthesis. So, at the end of big bang nucleosynthesis we have uh, deuterium then we have uh, tritium 
we also have helium 3. All of these we see we have seen were intermediate stages that led to the formation of helium 4 through two body interaction processes reactions. So, all of some amounts of all of these nuclei will also persist after a big bang is of the big bang nucleosynthesis is over. In addition to this we also have some elements which are heavier than helium 4 we have lithium 7 and also beryllium 7. Now, uh, lithium the tritium gets converted to helium 3 through beta decay. And we do not expect to see it around the tritium that was produced during the big bang nucleosynthesis. Similarly, the beryllium 7 gets converted to lithium 7 through electron capture. And uh, we expect to find uh, traces of the uh, these elements which were produced during the hot phase early hot phase of the universe still around in the uh, in the universe. So, these are deuterium <coughs> helium 3 and uh, lithium 7. So, in addition to the uh, hydrogen that is the proton and helium 4 which are the uh, two most abundant nuclei. Uh, roughly uh, one fourth is in uh, by weight is in helium 4 and the rest is in hydrogen. There are also very small traces of, uh, of uh, deuterium uh, helium 3 and uh, uh, lithium 7. Now, let us uh, take up this uh, deuterium uh, for discussion next. So, uh, the important point is that the deuterium abundance after the big bang nucleosynthesis is uh, essentially the deuterium abundance uh, when the big bang nucleosynthesis starts off. So, the, for the big bang nucleosynthesis to start off we require the uh, deuterium to combine uh, two deuterium nuclei to combine to form helium 3 or tritium and there is a critical density for that and uh, the uh, and the density the abundance that we have now is just uh, basically just corresponds to that. So, the uh, predicted deuterium abundance at the end of big bang nucleosynthesis uh, is uh, 1.2 into 10 to the power minus 7 divided by omega baryon h square. <coughs> so, what are the uh, points to note here? The first point is that the uh, predicted deuterium abundance is much smaller compared to the helium abundance which is roughly one fourth of the total nucleons are in helium, roughly three fourths are in hydrogen, the remaining three fourths by weight of the nucleons are in hydrogen and we have this small amount in deuterium which is the third most abundant uh, approximately the third most abundant species produced in the big bang nucleosynthesis. So, you see that uh, the uh, fraction of nucleons in deuterium is extremely small it has fallen significantly that is the first thing it is extremely small. The second thing is that uh, the uh, deuterium abundance is inversely proportional to omega baryon into this combination omega baryon h square 
And uh, so this is very important because we have seen that the helium abundance is insensitive to the baryon density. So it does not really tell us much about the uh, present value of the baryon density. It puts some constraints on the expansion rate at the epoch when helium was produced, before helium was produced. But in contrast, the uh, deuterium abundance is sensitive to uh, the omega baryon. Uh, so if you can measure the, uh, the fraction of nucleons in deuterium, one can uh, constrain the uh, observationally constrain the value of omega baryon into h square. And uh, for uh, the fiducial value which we have uh, been adopting which is omega baryon h square is equal to 0 0.02. This is the fiducial value that we have uh, that we have been adopting. The uh, deuterium abundance uh, comes out to be 0 0.02. 6 into 10 to the power minus 5. So measurements of the deuterium abundance can essentially constrain omega baryon h square. And we also see that the deuterium abundance is extremely small. It is of the order of uh, 10 to the power uh, predicted to be of the order of 10 to the power minus 5 minus 6. So it is observationally also a very uh, difficult and challenging task to constrain this. <coughs> Now let us take a brief look at what the uh, observations uh, tell us. So uh, <coughs> traditionally, uh, historically, there have uh, mainly been three different kinds of observations which have been uh, which have given inputs as to the uh, deuterium uh, abundance, and the observational uh, observations actually tell us the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen. This is the quantity which can so you. If you can measure the, uh, uh, the deuterium line and the hydrogen line from the same uh, place, you can uh, then determine the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen and observationally this is what has been <coughs> traditionally determined by uh, three, uh, three different kinds of observations. Let me just uh, uh, mention these uh, observ kinds of observations. The first one <coughs> is uh, <coughs> These are spectroscopic observations of the interstellar medium. So this is the gas uh, between the stars in our own galaxy. So uh, spectroscopic observations of this gas, they, uh, they tell us that the uh, deuterium to hydrogen ratio, uh, this is equal to 1.6 uh, plus minus 0 0.09 into 10 to the power minus 5. So this is uh, one kind of uh, observation. Uh, then uh, there is another kind of observation which also provides uh, uh, inputs on this. The second kind of observation is observations of the solar wind. <coughs> and we have uh, right in the beginning of towards the beginning of this course, we have learned about the solar wind. This is a stream of energetic particles that are emitted from the sun. So the, uh, first conjectured by uh, Parker and then subsequently measured. So uh, uh, in the sun, the deuterium gets converted into helium 3. The deuterium H2 in the sun, which I also denote by D, gets converted to helium 3 and uh, uh, measurements of helium 3 in the solar wind tell us about the combined uh, uh, abundance of helium 3 and uh, deuterium and uh, this puts limits uh, this tells us about the deuterium to helium uh, to hydrogen uh, abundance and uh, these observations uh, they constrain let me write it down 
they constrain deuterium plus helium 3. So, you send out a satellite and measured the uh, abundance of helium 3 in the solar wind uh, outside the earth's atmosphere and these constrain the combination of de deuterium and helium 3 and they tell us that the dyh ratio deuterium to hydrogen ratio is uh, 2.6 plus minus 0 0.6 plus minus 1.4. So, here we have two kinds of uncertainties one is the breaking up into deuterium and helium and other is the statistical uncertainty in the measurement anyway. Uh, uh, these observations tell us uh, that the deuterium to hydrogen ratio is in this range. And finally, we have a third kind of uh, observation. These are observations of the Jovian atmosphere again right at the beginning we learned about the uh, different planets and uh, I told you that uh, Jupiter is uh, mainly made up of gas gaseous material and uh, uh, hydrogen heli uh, ammonia etcetera. And uh, so, we can use uh, the observations of the atmosphere of Jupiter to determine the abundance of uh, whatever spectral uh, lines you can identify and these observations uh, they, uh, they indicate that, uh, that d by h is equal to 5 uh, plus minus 2 into 10 to the power minus 5. Well, this is uh, these are the uh, traditional uh, traditionally this is uh, these are the kind of uh, observations that people have used to constrain the deuterium to hydrogen ratio and of late of late I mean maybe past decade uh, more than a decade possibly uh, 15 years or so maybe going on to 20 years now uh, little less than that maybe 15 years in the 90s and uh, last uh, decade. There have been, or it has been possible to measure uh, deuterium in the uh, intergalactic medium. So, we have learned that uh, the universe is filled with galaxies. Uh, and uh, but the it is not only that the universe is filled with galaxies the intervening space between the galaxies is also uh, there is a gas gaseous material that occupies the uh, intervening space between the different galaxies it is largely ionized but there are uh, hydrogen there there is hydrogen there and uh, and there are uh, there is helium there uh, deut helium deuterium all these elements are present there also and uh, so uh, question is how do you detect uh, how do you uh, detect this uh, intergalactic medium how do you observe it well the basic uh, idea is that I am the observer over here and uh, we look at a distant quasar well let me briefly touch upon what is a quasar a quasar is a very bright object which uh, looks very much like a star. So, it is a quasi it is a quasi stellar object that is how the name uh, quasar comes. So, it is extremely small it it does not occupy any uh, it occupies a very small angle in the sky. So, which is what we mean by a quasi stellar object. But the spectrum of a quasar is quite different from a star. A star we have seen uh, this, this light from a star is well described by a black body spectrum with absorption lines. On the contrary, a quasar has a power law kind of uh, uh, it has a flat uh, it has a power law spectrum with emission lines and absorption lines. So, this is a very bright object over here and if you can now uh, look at the light coming from this very bright object and there are, is some gas over here IgM intergalactic medium. 
then the gas over here will produce absorption lines in this quasar spectrum and you will be then able to do uh, then find out what is there in the intergalactic medium. And you can use this now people have been carrying out observations of, uh, of the IGM in the redshift range 2 to 3. So, this has got a very big advantage that a redshift 2 to 3 we have learned means quite a distant object. So, the gas that we are looking at is pretty far away. Not only that, it is pretty back in the past. So, it would not have been affected by stars, the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen. This is something that I should have mentioned earlier. Deuterium we have seen has a low binding energy. of the light elements that we have discussed. Deuterium has the lowest binding energy, so it has a low binding energy and it is easily destroyed by stars. So, the fact that we have to uh, take into account is any observation of deuterium is actually just a lower limit. There could have been more deuterium which has been destroyed by stars. Okay. So, any observed d by h is only a lower limit. on the primordial ratio. So, primordial the primordial abundance could have been higher than what is observed. So, the observations of the intergalactic medium allow us to probe uh, high red shifts. So, if you go back in the past less stars would have been formed and there is a less chance of having uh, removed, uh, uh, removed uh, some of the uh, deuterium and uh, these observations they indicate they uh, are interpreted. So, observations along the line of sight to high redshift quasars they uh, now tell us that d by h has a value uh, 2.78. Uh, let me also give the error bars. So, you have plus uh, 0 0.4 and uh, minus uh, 0 0.8 into 10 to the power minus 5. And uh, I have told you that observations of uh, this d by h ratio are, uh, are sensitive to uh, the value of omega bar baryon h square. So, uh, these of this value of uh, the ratio uh, of uh, d by h the deuterium, uh, deuterium to hydrogen ratio they tell us that uh, omega baryon h square uh, has a value 0 0.21 sorry 0 point yes 2.21 0 0.02 one four uh, plus minus zero point zero two. So this is the value uh, which is inferred from uh, observations of uh, deuterium, the deuterium abundances. Uh, so. Uh, there are all these other elements helium 3, lithium and lithium which are also produced uh, during uh, the big bang nucleosynthesis, but uh, the abundances are smaller and I shall not go into uh, the de uh, for the details of, uh, of the observations and the uh, predictions uh, for these elements. Let us now uh, change the topic of our discussion and uh, turn our attention again on the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, uh, the discussion till now has been uh, 
uh, has been uh, centered at a redshift of around 10 to the power 9 and uh, we have seen that when the universe is uh, relative dominated by relativistic particles, so it is relativistic. And we have uh, one photon, uh, the CMBR photons, and uh, three neutrinos. <clears throat> and if you calculate the uh, the uh, the de the uh, critic the density parameter uh, corresponding to this, uh, if you calculate the density parameter corresponding to these constituents that is the uh, present value of the density parameter omega r naught <coughs> then uh, we have seen that uh, this uh, combination of photons and three neut uh, neutrinos ma massless neutrinos whose temperature is somewhat lower than the photons they finally the final contribution uh, gives us a density 1.68 into uh, energy density into the Stephen Boltzmann constant into the present temperature of the CMBR. We want to calculate the present value of the density parameter. So, this is the present energy density corresponding to this mixture and to calculate the uh, density parameter what we have to do is divide this by C square to convert it into mass density and divide it by uh, the critical density now and this will give us the uh, density parameter. And just to remind you the present value of the uh, photons of the CMBR is the temperature is 2.725 Kelvin. And uh, this uh, has a value uh, which is uh, 4.15 into 10 to the power minus uh, 5 h to the power minus 2 the h dependence come from comes from here so we see that at present this uh, density of the photon and the uh, three, three neutrinos cmbr and the three neutrinos is extremely small compared to the critical density and of, of course compared to the matter present in the universe also compared to the dark energy which is more than the matter but at an epoch of 10 to the power 9 the universe was dominated by these relativistic particles let us just look back and determine uh, how this ratio. So, let us look at how as the universe evolves, how does the ratio of the matter density and the density of the relativistic particles, how does this evolve? So, uh, this is something we have discussed earlier also, but let us look at it again. So, the relativistic particles rho r as a function of uh, temperature or redshift is essentially <clears throat> 1 plus z to the power 4. It scales uh, as the scale factor to the power minus 4 into the present density which is omega r naught uh, into rho critical naught. Whereas, the matter density as a function of uh, scales as a to the power minus 3 so, 1 plus z to the power 3 omega matter naught rho critical naught. So, if we calculate the ratio rho r by rho matter, the ratio of the relativistic particles, density in the relativistic particles to the density in the non relativistic matter, this will have a 1 plus z dependence and uh, then we will have the ratio omega relativistic naught which we just calculated divided by omega matter naught. And 1 plus z is basically 1 by the scale factor which I can write as the, the temperature at that redshift divided by the present value of the temperature. <coughs> by the ratio of the density parameters. 
Now let us ask the question, <coughs> when are the density of matter and, re, of, uh, and the relativistic particles the same? <coughs> this is what is called the epoch of uh, matter radiation equality. So <coughs> let us calculate the temperature when these two have the same density. So we all that you have to do is you have to set this equal to 1 and uh, this gives us the uh, temperature. So we have worked out the numerical value for this and we know that T gamma naught is uh, 2.75. Uh, uh, 2 so putting in these numbers we find that the temperature at which matter radiation equality occurs uh, has a value uh, 6.56 into 10 to the power 4 uh, omega matter naught, the present value of the matter density into h square. <coughs> and uh, we have seen uh, that uh, that present values, uh, so the present uh, present observations seem to indicate that omega matter naught has a value 0 0.3, h has a value 0 0.7 which is more or less uh, indicative of omega matter naught h square having a value 0 0.15. For these values the uh, equality occurred at uh, 10 to the power 4 Kelvin which is what I had mentioned earlier. So above 10 to the power 4, so in the range 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, the universe is actually dominated by these relativistic particles and below 10 to the power 9, so T greater than T equality, the universe is dominated by relativistic particles and less than T equality, it is dominated by the non-relativistic matter. <clears throat> okay. So let this is a brief background about the expansion which uh, it's a it's a recapitulation we had discussed this several times earlier. Now let us look at the CFBR. Uh, at a temperature of around uh, 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, the uh, CMBR photons have uh, adequate energy uh, to keep the nuclei ionized. We have, we have seen that uh, so at temperature of uh, 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, that is the temperature we are starting off at and the typical, so what do we have? We have the protons <coughs> and electrons and the helium, mainly the helium nuclei and the electrons and uh, we are assuming that the, the universe is neutral. So the density, number density of <coughs> the positive particles and negative particles are more or less uh, are the same. <coughs> These, the electronic binding energy for to form a hydrogen atom. So suppose you look at this possibility of the proton and electron combining to form a hydrogen atom or helium 4 and electrons, 2 electrons combining to form the helium 4 atom these have binding energy of the order of 10 electron volts. Whereas the uh, temperature here corresponds to an energy scale which is considerably higher than this. <coughs> so at these temperatures the, uh, the nuclei and electrons are separate so the, uh, they are all ionized. So you have the nuclei <laughs> and you have the electrons separate and uh, the photons they uh, scatter of uh, of the electrons and the electrons also uh, scatter with the nuclei and the whole thing is so they are all very tightly bound so this and the photon 
they are all very tightly coupled and in thermal equilibrium through scattering and have us have the same temperature so at a temperature of around 10 to the power 9 kelvin uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, situation that you have now uh, let us ask let us take a look at uh, this uh, this uh, scattering and uh, the equilibrium and the scattering at uh, let us take a little closer look at this now uh, the cmdr photons are essentially being scattered of the electrons that is the main thing and uh, this is uh, so the uh, cmdr photons and the electrons this is the scattering <coughs> now uh, let us so we have we have seen that uh, the photons have a very high heat capacity compared to the matter rest of the matter so this uh, scattering is actually we know for sure that this scattering is not going to change the energy content of the uh, total cmbr that is not going to be possible because the photons the same wave photons have a the photons have a very high heat capacity <coughs> compared to matter much greater than that matter of the matter we have evaluated these numbers earlier on and we know that this has a very high heat capacity compared to the the electrons and the nuclei so the uh, scattering between the interaction between the electrons the matter and the cmbr is not going to change the energy content of the total uh, cmbr because it has a much higher heat capacity but it is possible that an individual photon may uh, exchange energy of the order of kbt so that is the possibility that we are looking at so it is possible that an individual photon energy of order kbt which is the typical energy of the photon uh, at any temperature t so let us see what is the rate at which an individual photon may exchange energy of the order of kbt through scattering with the electrons so to do this what we have to do is we have to look at the scattering rate per photon so that is the rate at which a single photon will scatter of electrons and the process here is for as to for calculating the scattering rate we have to essentially just look at the thomson scattering cross section and uh, we can calculate the scattering rate so this is quite simple to calculate Uh, let us denote it by lambda nu gamma so we have the thomson scattering cross section sigma t which we have dis considered come across earlier this cross section into the number density of electrons into the speed of light this will give us the rate at which the scattering takes place so sigma t has a value uh, which we have encountered earlier 6.6235 into 10 to the power minus 9 meter square 
So, that is the Thomson scattering cross section which we have encountered earlier and we have here the speed of light which we know. The only unknown that we have to calculate is the number density of electrons. The number density of electrons we can assume is that the universe is uh, charge neutral. So, uh, the number density of electrons will be the uh, it will be basically the number density of uh, hydrogen atom nuclei plus twice the number density of. So, it will be number density of hydrogen nuclei plus twice the number density of helium 4 because every helium 4 has 2 protons doubly charged. So, this uh, and we have seen that uh, the total baryons are divided between these in the ratio one this is uh, 0 0.24 uh, and this is uh, 0 0.76 roughly. So, uh, this will be 0 0.76 plus uh, by weight 0 0.24 is in uh, is in uh, is in the form of helium. So, uh, the number of uh, number density of helium will be uh, half of that rather uh, one fourth of that. So, I have uh, because they have four uh, uh, so one into one fourth into the number of baryons. So, one four by weight one fourth of the uh, the number of uh, <coughs> baryons by weight has gone into uh, helium and uh, there will be a factor of 2 here because uh, there are 2 protons in each of them plus 0.7 uh, this into uh, sorry this into the fraction of uh, into uh, point uh, 24 this will give us the electron uh, density and uh, number of baryons is basically omega baryon divided by into critical density divided by the mass of a hydrogen the mass of the proton or the mass of the hydrogen atom. So, this uh, 0 0.88 into uh, omega baryon into uh, rho c naught by m h and this is basically the number of baryons. So, <coughs> We know that the number density of baryons scales as uh, this into a factor of 1 plus z cube. This is the present density, so 1 plus z cube. And uh, if you put in all the numbers here, it turns out that this uh, the scattering Thomson, uh, Thomson scattering, the scattering uh, rate per photon has a value uh, 1.97 into uh, 10 to the power minus 19 omega baryon h square t by t gamma naught to the power 3 which comes because of this scale factor 1 plus z cube. T gamma naught is the present value of the CMBR temperature. So, this gives us the uh, scattering rate uh, per photon. So, if so, this is the rate at which a single photon gets scattered. Now, what we would like to calculate is the rate at which a single photon loses or gains energy, exchanges energy. This is not the rate at which the single photon loses or gains energy. We are in interested in the energy transfer. So, to calculate that, let us consider the scattering. In the scattering process, a photon uh, has momentum uh, k b t typically has momentum k b t by c and this is the momentum that it also imparts to the uh, this is the mom imparted to a, an electron in a scattering. So, this is the momentum imparted. So, the energy uh, uh, imparted to the uh, electron will be the momentum squared which is uh, then the energy in a scattering will be uh, of the order of k b t by c square that is the momentum squared 
by the uh, mass of the electron p square by 2 m and uh, so this is of the order of uh, k b t square by m electron c square. So if you look at the fractional energy, fraction of the energy that is transferred in one scattering, then this will be of the order of uh, k b t uh, square by m electron c square divided by k b t. This is the energy of a photon. So this is of the order of k b t by m electron c square. So we can calculate the rate at which energy is uh, being uh, exchanged by a photon uh, by multiplying the uh, scattering rate into the uh, fractional energy that is exchanged in every uh, fraction of its energy that is exchanged in every scattering which is uh, k b t by the mass the rest mass energy of the photon of the uh, of the electron. So what you have to do is you have to uh, use this value that we just calculated <coughs> uh, over here and this turns out uh, to be 9 into 10 to the power minus 29 omega baryon h square t by t gamma naught to the power 4. So what the what what is the consequence of this? The consequence of this is okay. We have to now come. So for the uh, energy transfer to be significant, for there to be significant energy transfer, we require the uh, this ratio to be uh, more than or equal to one. Then there will be uh, significant. energy transfer and uh, we have calculated the Hubble parameter during this uh, relativistic epoch. Uh, this is all we are assuming this is all occurring in the relativistic epoch. So we have calculated the Hubble parameter. So if you apply this condition where the uh, rate that the rate of the energy transfer to the Hubble parameter this ratio should be uh, of the order unity, it turns out that uh, this occurs at uh, uh, temperature which we can call the temp freezing temp, where the energy distribution of the photon uh, of the photon gets frozen. This uh, has a value 1.5 uh, into uh, 10 to the power 4. Omega baryon h square to the power of minus half, and it has a value of uh, 10 to the power 5 for the fiducial value of the omega baryon h square that we have been using. So, what do we learn from this exercise? What we learn is that the uh, a photon. Uh, exchanges energy with the electrons uh, till uh, till the universe is hotter as long as the universe is hotter than this. Once the universe is cooler than this, this ratio falls below 1 and the energy distribution of the photons whatever it is is frozen. The energy transfer uh, becomes insignificant and all of this occurs in the uh, radi in the relativistic era because the universe becomes matter dominated at a temperature of 10 to the power 4 so the energy transfer stops at uh, at uh, a very uh, at this temperature 10 to the power 5 but the collisions between the photons and electrons st still continue subsequent to that for looking whether the collisions are effective or not you have to consider the ratio of the re collision rate to the Hubble parameter and this so the collisions if you were to push this calculation all the way to the present and then it follows that the 
collision rate is of order unity at uh, when the universe uh, has a temperature of 130 Kelvin. But so the collisions, but these are all elastic collisions after a temperature of 10 to the power 5 the collisions are the dominant process are elastic collisions and there is no exchange of energy they continue to be coupled but the uh, there is no exchange of energy in these collisions and this is the collisions would continue till 10 to the power till 130 kelvin after which the collisions also would become uh, insignificant well this calculation is incorrect why is it incorrect because it assumes that the universe is completely ionized all the way till present. In reality what happens is that as the universe cools uh, the uh, protons and the electrons when the universe becomes sufficiently cool the protons and the electrons they combine and uh, to form the hydrogen atom uh, giving out a photon. And uh, one can work out this uh, this ratio. So one can work out the ratio of uh, of uh, neutral hydrogen and ionized uh, ionized hydrogen using the Saha ionized, assuming that it is in equilibrium. And using the Saha ionization formula, which we have encountered earlier. And uh, this calculation, you have to put in the binding energy 13.6 eV for the hydrogen atom and work out the Saha ionization formula. And these calcul this calculation based on the assumption that these are all in equilibrium, they uh, give results that uh, 97 percent of the hydrogen is ionized at a temperature of 4200 Kelvin and uh, less than 1 percent is ionized this is ionized at a temperature of 3000 Kelvin. So what we see is that the universe that the uh, you became neutral at around 3000 Kelvin. This is if we assume equilibrium. In reality this assumption of equilibrium uh, does not hold and one has to actually solve the rate equations because when the density of uh, protons and electrons falls, when the, when the uh, proton and electron combine to form the hydrogen atom, this process is called recombination. The density falls and once the density falls, they, this reaction goes out of equilibrium and one has to look at the detailed calculation. Well, the bottom line is that the universe is neutral. So bottom line is that the universe is no longer filled with ions, it is filled with hydrogen atoms by a temperature of around 3000 Kelvin. And once the universe becomes neutral, the uh, scattering uh, process, scattering becomes insignificant and the photons are free particles effectively, photons are free. Which brings us to the uh, picture that we have for the CMBR. So let me just uh, draw this picture for you. So I am the observer, we are the observer here. And we are sitting in a part of the universe that is neutral and if I look at a photon trace back of CMBR photon which is arriving at me now and I trace it backwards, tracing it backward means also going back into the past and the universe is hotter. At when the universe is at of a temperature 3000 Kelvin, the universe was ionized once so here the there are no ionized particles so the part photon propagates freely. Once it is at a redshift of around 1000, 
temperature of around 3000 Kelvin. The universe is ionized and the photon no longer propagates freely, it gets, so this is propagates freely till here, the photon gets scattered. And we cannot see anything beyond this because once the photon gets scattered, uh, the optical depth is greater than 1. So this is also referred to as the last scattering surface. So uh, let me uh, now uh, bring, uh, we are running out of time, so let me now bring today's lecture to a close. Uh, let me just briefly recapitulate what we have learned in this course. We started off by discussing planets and then stars, our galaxy and finally we moved on to discussing the entire universe.